Greetings and salutations, friends! Today we are going to be taking a look at the Dark Elf Army. Now, the Dark Elf Army has gone through some rather radical changes over the uh, course of Warhammer history, being um, a not horrible army in the 6th edition to being practically one of the best armies in the 7th edition to the current 8th edition where they're pretty balanced yet pretty damn good as well. A lot of that power has to do with some of their special rules, giving their bonuses to dark magic and granting one of their elite units hatred, which makes them pretty damn ridic, and of course they are elves. And although, in my personal opinion, they are not quite as broken as the high elves, they are certainly more than capable of making a mess of pretty much anyone they're actually going to go up against. As for organization. The Dark Elf army is organized more or less into private warbands the vast majority of the time, with powerful nobles and captains running crews of raiders up and down the coasts of the Old World to increase their own wealth and prestige. The Dark Elf army as a standing army is more a collection of these varied warbands rather than a traditional standing army. Although, mind you, the various cities do of course maintain standing militias, although I am say militias because it is technically uh, enforced service on the populace, the civilian population. These are still elves though, so you gotta remember even the high elf spearmen are technically militias. So. Don't compare them to your average human militia. These are fantastic fighters despite their um, technical status as militia. However, there are of course more um, regimented formations within the Dark Elf army like the Executioners of Harganoth and the Black Guard of Malekith. And many of the cities also maintain more or less permanent garrisons of professional soldiers. But the vast majority of uh, Dark Elf offensive actions, besides their occasional failed invasions of Ulthuan, takes uh, the form of raiding parties, where the uh, responsibility of command is divided between the captains leading the navy and the officers leading the landing forces, though in some cases the two are one and the same, with many Dark Elf captains possessing a bit of a dual role as officers, or simply just holding command powers due to birth or, well, violence, one out of two. The leader of the Dark Elves has to be, of course, Malekith the Witch King, or, well, does it? Does it have to be Malekith the Witch King? Well, that depends. If we just for a moment assume, like I said in the Dark Elves video, that we get an expansion with Bretonia, High Elves, Skaven, and Dark Elves, would they add Ulthuan and Nagarond? Personally, I don't think so. I think they would add a considerable part of uh, well, the Old World. They would add in Bretonia, naturally. They'd probably add in the Blighted Marshes, the homes of the Skaven, and they'd probably add in Telia and Destelia, perhaps. I don't think we'd see Ulthuan, simply because I still think that they might be skipping naval battles entirely. Now, we have had some more news recently, but again, we've had no news as to how anything naval is going to work, and, uh, well, my personal assumption is that they're probably going to skip it or, you know, minimalize it in some way. Of course, I could be wrong, and I kinda hope I'm wrong, but if we do see Nagarond and Ulthuan, then it should definitely be Malekith. But if these are expeditions sent into Bretonia, Estelia, or Telia, then they should be commanded by some slightly less ridiculous thing, perhaps even a uh, new character invented by Creative Assembly themselves. Or, of course, as far as the Dark Elves are concerned, it might as well just be uh, Malekith's mother, Morathi, which, well, she's a few, not even a few, she's like, what, 10,000 bloody years at this point? But, uh, that marvelous miracle of makeup keeps her ever young and all of that nonsense. But yeah. 
Malekith, of course, being the Witch King, has to be the leader if they're going to include the entirety of the Dark Elf Nation, if not send it off to some uh, lieutenant like Morathi or uh, Elebron, perhaps. Moving on to the uh, heroes, though, you start out with the Dread Lord, which is your relatively standard combat hero. He's got fantastic weapon skill, I mean, he's an elf. So, weapon skill 7, initiative 8, and always strike first, because that is his thing. Oh, before I continue on, I should probably also mention, the Dark Elves have the same special rule as the High Elves in always strike first. Pretty much all of their units have this special ability, always strike first, so... They're pretty fast, though even then, if initiative of 8, he's probably not going to be needing it the vast majority of the time, but every now and then. Uh, the most of the leaders also have the Eternal Hatred rule, or well, no, most of them, quite a few of the characters have it. The Eternal Hatred rule, which also applies to the Black Guard, means that the units are affected by hatred for every round of combat, not just the first. And hatred, as we all know at this point, means that you get to re-roll your two wound attacks, so that's pretty damn handy. Additionally, every single unit in the army, except for war beasts, has the Murderous Prowess special rule, which allows them to re-roll all wound rolls off a 1. So if you roll 1 on a d6, you get to re-roll that dice, which is pretty damn good. And the spellcasters has Hecarty's Blessing, which is a 1 plus to the dice roll when casting dark magic spells. And the uh, dark elves are quite fond of their dark magic. But back on to the Dreadlord. He's nothing overly special, really. You use him to add a little bit of oomph to certain units, and even perhaps to snipe special characters, as his rather high weapon skill and high initiative often allows him to cut down enemy characters before they can strike back. However, he still doesn't have that much armor, and he, like all elves, are toughness 3, so... You have to be a little bit careful with him, as being an elf lord, he is by no means cheap. Otherwise, the Dreadlord is a standard combat hero and should be available to you in whatever numbers you so choose, really, as your standard army general. Next up, we have the Sorceress, which is divided into the Supreme Sorcerers and the Sorcerers. The Supreme Sorcerers just simply being a bigger banner version. Now, the sorceresses are, of course, the ones that are using all of that lovely dark magic, which is uh, pretty damn handy. You are essentially very skilled as a dark elf army commander at blasting the enemy units into tiny screaming squivering bits with large amounts of horrible, horrible, horrible magic. And you also have some pretty damn ridiculous spells for buffing. And they can, technically, use uh, pretty much all of the lores of magic, although, well, you primarily want dark magic for the obvious fact that you get a bonus to it, but you can use all of them, which means you can use a wide variety of nature magic spell, or as that might seem, on dark elves to buff your units. And, of course, additional toughness on elves is never a bad thing. But, of course, if you're a true Dark Elf player, you will be sticking to dark magic rather than some of the more ridiculous thing like nature magic, because, well, the most recent Codex is sadly one of Matt Ward's many, many crimes against humanity, and so it should be taken with just a pinch of salt every now and then. In Total War, I would prefer if they were entirely limited to dark magic, to be honest, because they're Dark Elf Sorceresses. Why the hell are they studying nature magic or celestial magic? I mean, that maybe you could get away with fire magic, you know, but... Mm, I don't know. I'd prefer if, if they'd just stick to dark magic. It's not like that doesn't have enough cool spells anyway, with uh, a teleport and several ways of just blasting enemy units to tiny squivering bits, so... I'd prefer it that way, but... We'll wait and see if, of course, the Dark Elves are ever actually implemented. Moving on, we have the High Beast Master, who 
well, how do we explain this guy? Well, he is a buffing unit, one would probably say. You get this guy if you want to have a serious beast, dark beast master, contingent in your army, as the dark elves have access to a fair bit of uh, monsters and other horrifying creatures to do their fighting for them. However, he costs twice as much as a dreadlord, and he comes in light armor with less attack and less initiative, so he's not a combat hero. You use him because he buffs your monster. One beast unit per turn within three of the high beast master gains plus d3 attacks, which can be pretty damn handy as it can give you potentially another three attacks on a beast. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of the High Beastmaster, he's far too expensive for what he does, but again, Matt Ward, cursed be his name. <clears throat> However, in a Total War game, as with so many other units, there is an opportunity to undo the wrongs that has been done to the poor Dark Elves. The High Beastmaster could simply just be a hero riding a nasty gnarly monster which buffs it to, to all hell which would be cool, or maybe you can have him as an agent and take him into your army and have him buff out all the beasts in the unit, or maybe he has a targeted buff or something like that. I think you could certainly make him an interesting character if you just, you know, give him a bit, a bit of synergy, make you, make you want to take him because he will make your big, nasty, killy, angry monster units even bigger and nastier which is always a good reason to take him. Onwards, though, we come to the Black Ark Fleet Master. The Black Ark Fleet Master sadly suffers from uh, much the same problem as the High Beast Master, in that he's more expensive than the Dreadlord, and isn't really better. Of course, in Fluff, the Black Ark Fleet Master is supposed to be a bit of a badass because, you know, he's the leader of a Black Bloody Ark, which means he is one of the proper lieutenants of uh, Malekith. He is supposed to be a proper badass, but he's not. It's just better to take a Dreadlord, which is, again, a little bit annoying. I think you should probably just buff him up a little bit in a total war game, make him a little bit more fighty, make him of course only available to, you know, raiding units, so you can only take him in armies where you have actual Dark Elf raiders, and when you join these raiders they get various benefits, like uh, they uh, get a little bit better attack and they get to use his uh, special rule where he makes his unit unbreakable for a single turn, which is pretty damn cool. And of course he also looks pretty awesome, which is a pretty good reason to include him, in my opinion. But again, he's going to need a bit of a uh, change in a Total War game, seeing as on tabletop he just isn't quite worth it. Then we have something that is actually worth it, the Master. Now, the Master is essentially a title, I'd probably say. Any Dark Elf, essentially, could be considered a master, although this guy is a little bit higher. He is a low noble, I think is probably the best way to describe him, and therefore he is given the title of master, both by slaves and by Dark Elves. The master is pretty cheap, but he's also pretty damn feisty. With, well, he's an elf, so strength 4, reasonable for an elf, and 3 attacks at initiative 7. Which makes him pretty damn good as an extra beef unit, plus he actually has armor, plus the murderer's prowess, special rule of course, and so, being cheap, having good armor, relatively tough, good leadership, he's the perfect hero to just scatter throughout your army a little bit here and there, to add extra oomph to your units of dark and spearmen. A variant on the master is the so-called Death Hag. The Death Hag costs 15 points more, so relatively negligible, has a two-handed weapon, frenzy, and poisoned attack special rule, giving him even more oomph than the master, and making him quite capable of taking on large monster. However, he doesn't have anywhere near the same armor, which means that instead of the 2 plus armor save that you can get a master to, this guy is never going to get anything better than a 5+, plus, 
which is a problem on Toughness 3. And he only gets that 5+, plus if he is taken along with a Cauldron of Blood, which is from well, Chariot, essentially. But the Chariot costs 200 points, so suddenly your Death Hag is now very, very expensive, and he's still kind of vulnerable, and now he's, well, a large target, which is going to be screaming for a cannonball to the face. However, the unit that it is put into gets plus armor saves. For example, they get plus 6, so 1 to a normal unit, which takes you from armor save plus 3 to plus 2, for example, or if you give them to a unit of witch elves who have light armor, so bugger all, we'll give them 2 extra armor, giving them if memory serves, plus 4, or potentially plus 5, I'm not entirely sure about that, I haven't played uh, Dark Elves in a very, very long time. And it lets all friendly units with murderous intent within 6 inches re-roll all failed 2 wounds, so you get another re-roll, so it does make units of Witch Elf in particular absolute bloody murderers. And, as if that wasn't enough, it gives 1 plus attack, but if the unit is already frenzied, which gives 1 plus attack, so, well, it gives 1 plus attack due to the frenzied rule that it gives the unit, but if the unit is already frenzied, then it gets plus 2 attacks, which does mean that you could have an absolutely absurd unit with... Uh, I'm thinking this might be one of the highest attacks per model units in the game, really. I mean, uh, what could really get up to this? Well, you'd have to go monster size, you'd have to go ogres, um, kitted out chaos lords, of course, but you know, that's not really a unit. So I'm not entirely sure if anyone could actually match a unit of witch elves with a cauldron of blood. Since that ought to be, what, 4 or 5 attacks per model? Which is pretty damn ridiculous, certainly. So, of course, you could have it just be a buffing unit in Total War terms that just increases the attack potential of a unit exponentially. On the other hand, it is very, very large and is going to be begging for several cannonballs to the face. So, not sure about that one. It's... An interesting unit, to be sure, but I think I'd like it to be more of a battle standard and less of a fighting unit. Like, you buy the Cauldron of Blood, it has a massively increased range, where it actually affects nearby units, but it's in a unit all by itself, very vulnerable to enemy artillery fire, so it will require a bit of protecting, maybe by, by magical means, for example. Could be interesting. The last of the uh, heroes is the, well, iconic, really, Dark Elf hero, the Assassin. The Assassin, when kitted out correctly, can kill pretty much any hero and lord. Of course, there are some exceptions, like if he runs headfirst into a kitted out Chaos Lord, and he somehow fails to kill the bastard on his first go, then the Assassin is going to be disappearing in a puff of blood really bloody quickly, but the Assassin is relatively cheap. If you actually manage to uh, jump the Assassin onto an enemy hero, he can earn his points back and many, many times more very, very quickly indeed. And here's the cool thing. The Assassin has a special rule that is called simply Hidden. He hides within a friendly unit, so that your enemy doesn't know whether or not there is an Assassin in any given unit so that when the unit gets into combat, the Dark Elf player might choose to reveal the Assassin, when the Assassin just jumps out of the unit's ranks and absolutely murders someone. A very, very good unit, and it is fantastic at making your enemy just a wee bit paranoid, thinking that there might be Assassins in every single unit. I probably shouldn't be sending my powerful combat heroes anywhere, should I? I should just let them sit here and be boring and waste of points. Or at least, that's the hope for a Dark Elf player anyways. In Total War, um, how would you implement this? Implementing the hidden special rule is only going to work if you can actually target enemy heroes instead of entire units, of course, but if you can, you could simply just hide him in a unit and have him spring out on command. It wouldn't be that hard to implement. If not, 
maybe give him some kind of limited stealth ability to try and hunt down enemy heroes, and particularly wizards, like if you can nab yourself a couple wizards with an assassin, you have more than paid for the little bastard. Of course, that is going to include walking behind the enemy lines with what is a relatively squishy hero. I mean, he doesn't carry much armor, and he is just an elf, so his toughness is nothing to brag about. So, you know, if he gets caught behind enemy lines, he's probably not making it back out of there unless he gets some serious magical assistance really damn quickly. But still could be a pretty cool hero, and uh, it would certainly make your opponent paranoid as all the hell, knowing that you might have a sneaky sneaky little stealth unit skirting around the battlefield being a threat to his valuable special characters. So that could be cool, I do hope they are added. Of course, I'm not even sure if it is possible, yes of course it is possible to do stealth units in the current Warscape engine, but um, I'm not sure if they would want to, because there is certainly some potential for brokenness in that. Moving on to the core unit, we start out with the Dread Spears, which are basic spearmen. Well, spear elves, to be correct, but you know. They've got fantastic stat line, really. Uh, their only real weakness is the fact that they have light armor, but they do have a shield and a spear, so... They're relatively defensive, they can weather a fair bit of shooting, and of course being uh, elven spearmen, they are just as horrifyingly dangerous as their high elf counterparts. With always strikes first and murderous prowess, they can beat up units that are considerably more expensive than them, especially if they get to actually stay on defensive, as then they get to fight in even more ranks. Same problem with the High Elves, though, I'm not entirely sure how they're actually going to represent the fact that Dark Elves are supposed to be fighting in, well, more ranks than their spears would really allow them to, so I'm um, not sure about that one. Of course, if they're going to be adding in the Dark Elves, they are guaranteed to be adding in the High Elves in the same expansion, because, well, watch enemies and all that nonsense. So, if they are going to do it, they're gonna have to figure out some way to represent that, you would think, but uh, we shall have to wait and see. Otherwise, they are a relatively standard spear unit. Fantastic on the defense, so pretty damn amazing on the offense too, really, being elves with high weapon skill initiative and always strike first, of course, plus the additional boost of murderous prowess. They are certainly worth their point cost, and if you put a hero unit in the front ranks, they get pretty damn oomphy indeed. They also come in a Bleak Swords variant, which have the exact same stats, but they have swords instead of spears, making them a wee bit more of an effective offensive unit than their spear-wielding counterparts, but of course they do sacrifice a fair bit of defensive staying power in return. However, light armor and shields and their high weapon skill still allows them to hold relatively well against most enemies. Just don't expect them to be quite as wonderfully grindy as the Dread Spears. Then you have the Dark Shards. Ugh, all of these silly names. You know, I much rather preferred this when they were simply Dark Elf Spearmen, Dark Elf Swordsmen, and Dark Elf Repeater Bolt Throwers, and, you know, Dark Elf Repeater Crossbowmen, because. It felt more natural to me, honestly. All of these emo names like Dread Spears, Bleak Swords, and Dark Shards, it just. I don't know, it feels like the author is trying way too bloody hard, but. Let's try not to bash on Matt Ward too much. Uh, after all, we cannot undo the damage that the fifth god of chaos did, so we'll simply just have to accept it. So. The Dark Elf Repeater Crossbowmen are fantastic range units. I mean, they're Repeater Crossbows. How could they not be amazing? And they are. They have good range, armor piercing, of course, and multiple shots. They absolutely annihilate medium to light armored units, 
but they do struggle a wee bit against super heavy cavalry and heavy armor. They do have armor piercing, but it's not quite as ridiculous as some of the things that other races have with, you know, full-on handguns or the super accurate arrows of the Wood Elves. But if you have them concentrate fire with uh, a repeater bolt thrower and some other ranged units, you can most certainly inflict some rather horrific damage on enemy units. And they should be a fantastic uh, ranged unit, although I would kinda like to see them in smaller numbers. Just like the High Elves, I would kind of like to see them in slightly smaller units than normal, so maybe a hundred for Dread Spears and uh, Bleak Swords and Dark Shards. Something along those lines, simply just because they're just a little bit better, and, uh, you know. They do still have light armor compared to the zero armor of certain other races that have comparable ranged attacks, so I'd kind of like that, but we shall see. And again, of course, they have a repeater crossbows, which means that they have a far higher rate of fire than a normal ranged unit anyway. Now, in uh, Total War, they could of course solve this simply by saying that, okay, each repeater crossbow fires six bolts, so it fires like chunk, 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 something like that, relatively quickly, one a second or something like that, and then it has to reload, and the reload time is relatively considerable. That could be one way of doing it, or you simply just give them a higher rate of fire, where, you know, they raise the crossbow, take aim, fire, and they aim again for a couple seconds, fire, etc. And just slow them down a bit, like... Total War is no stranger to this, like, hell, even in the uh, latest Total War game, although, again, different teams, so we can't be too sure that anything is going to carry over, you have several occasions where you see archer units, for example, fire their bows, then immediately knock another arrow and draw their bows, and then stand there holding their bows in the firing position for an uncomfortable amount of time, like 10 plus seconds is like, what the hell are you even doing at this point? You are volley firing, you are not bloody taking aim, just release the goddamn arrow. But balance concerns, so we uh, might be seeing something along those lines. Additionally, they have the uh, possibility of taking a shield, which one would assume would work much like a pavis, so they get a bit of extra armor safe against return fire. So making the Dark Elf for a Peter Crossbowman one of the most potent ranged units in the game, but Unlike the Dwarves, who also have fantastic rain units, they are going to be handled quite easily by most cavalry units. A, a flank or rear charge, even by most light cavalry, should be able to inflict considerable damage on the units, seeing as they are only wearing light armor, and they are equipped with very simple hand weapons, daggers, short swords, that kind of stuff. So they shouldn't be too problematic to balance, one would think. Then we have the Black Ark Corsairs, the uh, Marines of the Dark Elf Nations, if you will. They have considerably heavier armor than their uh, Dark Elf Spearmen and Swordsmen counterpart, so uh, I would like to see them be available in, um, well, multiple variants. There is a variant with uh, shield and sword for a slightly more defensive setup, and perhaps a variant with uh, two hand weapons, so they're dual wielding. And they should also have access to a short bow, a so-called hand bow. Meaning that they would work a little bit like the Lothran Seaguard, being a unit that could both fire at ranged and fight up close. But, crucially, the Black Ark Corsairs have access to short bows, while as the Lothran Seaguard have access to normal bows, which aren't quite the long bows of their High Elf Archer cousins, but it's certainly a hell of a lot better than the short bow of the Black Ark Corsairs. However, the Corsairs do have one considerable advantage, namely the fact that they get a 4 plus armor save, being considerably more heavily armored than their normal counterparts. 
They could be a pretty damn cool unit, really. Where maybe you could even give the unit the ability to fire on the move, so they would close with the enemy, firing their short bows, maybe in kind of a skirmishy formation even, that'd be beautiful, they would be um, kind of cool skirmishes, and then closing in to kick the shit out of the bastards with uh, two hand weapons, dual wielding swords, or daggers, that kind of stuff. Could be a really, really awesome unit. They might, of course, being, you know, professional marines, be limited to only ship fighting, where you can only buy them as a part of a ship's crew, but I'd much rather prefer to see them available as infantry units, because well, they're cool, and uh, much like their other variants, they should be able to come in well, pretty much any numbers you want, really. If you want to have uh, an entire army of Black Ark Corsairs, then sure. Go ahead, I mean, that's a raiding army, and that's perfectly legit within the fluff, really. Uh, granted, you'd have some uh, Dark Rider scout cavalry and some uh, bolt throwers thrown in there, along with perhaps a few Dark Elf repeater crossbowmen, but, you know, it, you could get away with that as a fluff army, certainly. So, they'd be a pretty damn cool unit. Next, we have a strange unit, because it is now a core unit. I'll blame the fifth Chaos God for that one. The Witch Elves. Now, the Witch Elves being a core unit is a little bit odd, because, you know, they're relatively rare. Uh, there's not that many Witch Elves in Dark Elf society. Um, and most of the fluff states that there are, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of them, well, hundreds, there's certainly more than, you know, a thousand, but they're available in very limited numbers, so the thought of an entire army of witch elves seems a little bit insane, but okay, I guess. In Total War, I would probably like to see them somewhat limited, just because of their numbers, but it's not a huge deal. They should probably just be limited by the simple fact that they ought to be pretty damn expensive, if anything. Now, as for how they operate, well, if they operate by the good old-fashioned theory that if you throw enough mud at the wall, some of it's going to stick. They have an absolutely ludicrous amount of attacks. If you have uh, two ranks of ten of them, they fight in two ranks because I don't know, they just dance past each other, probably. They get 40 poisoned attacks. 40 fucking poisoned attacks. They are absolutely absurd. Most units will struggle to get out even a fourth of that, so yeah. They're high in initiative, always strike for first, and hatred. Plus, they're cheap, so, you know, they're pretty good. However, they are naked. Not even kidding you here. Like, look at them. This, that's not even bikini armor. That's just a leather thong. Which means that they are going to fall like absolute flies to any kind of shooting attack. Like, I remember a time when taking witch elves against wood elves was essentially just you telling your opponent that I've had a really bad day, and I'd like you to finish me off. <laughs> essentially. Um, even today, witch elves are incredibly squish, so, you know, shoot them to tiny little pieces and they are going to be an incredible waste of points. However, in a total war game, I'd like to see them buffed a little bit. Maybe you should only get a unit of 80 of them, but they get a ward save against ranged attacks, much like the wood elf war dancers, because, you know, they're running really, really fast, they're cavorting, and they're being all kinds of fancy with their footwork and shit, making them relatively hard to hit, but of course, if they do get hit, they're going to be falling over with a single wound, toughness of three, because elves and zero armor. So, yeah. It's going to take a bit of micro to actually get this unit uh, safely to the enemy, but if they get there, they should be pretty damn devastating with an absolute bucket of attacks. And then we have the, uh, well, probably the best light cavalry in the game, really, the Dark Elf Dark Riders. 
They are relatively expensive for light cavalry, however, they do come with the shields and repeater crossbows and bass cavalry with shields, which is actually pretty damn rare. So you get a decent armor save of 4 plus 50-50, you get spears to attack on the charge, and you get crossbow for harassment. So yeah, they're probably one of the best light cavalry units in the game, if not the best. You're probably going to have to have an argument with the High Elves about that and his Illyrian Reavers being also fantastic light cavalry, but uh, crossbows on horses is most certainly quite fucking fascinating. But uh, crossbows combined with light cavalry is always a fantastic thing, as you can piss off enemy super heavy cavalry to an absolutely ludicrous extent because, well, they're never going to catch you, and with crossbows you can actually do some real damage to them. The Dark Riders, though, with their high weapon skill and always strike first, are also pretty damn good in melee, or at the very least on the charge. Having essentially no armor, because even though they have decent enough armor, they're not going to be available in large enough units for a proper grind match. Should probably be available in units of maybe 60 rather than standard light cavalry size of 80, simply because, you know, they're really, really good and they've got crossbows, but um, you could probably get away with, with making them a unit of 80 as well. They are a remarkably flexible unit, allowing you to uh, just skirmish with them like light cavalry and harass enemy heavy cavalry. You can outfight many light cavalry units in the game with them and you will probably be able to catch them as well, or you could use them of course to attack enemy ranged units, so a really really nice unit really and uh, should be relatively simple to implement in a Total War game, although, like I said, you might want to limit their numbers just a little bit, as the Dark Riders are a core unit, which means that Dark Elf armies can technically take nothing but Dark Riders, which, um, well, it's going to make your opponent issue a fair few death threats at you, but, you know, if you take an entire army of Dark Riders, you deserve it, so there's that. As with 4 armor save, it's surprisingly hard to actually just, you know, pincushion the bastards with ranged weapons. Moving on to the special units part of the list, we start out with Shades. The Shades are a skirmishing unit, and they are a damn fine skirmishing unit, with uh, repeated crossbows, good movement speed, reasonable armor, for skirmishers anyway, and pretty damn fast. They are, well, like I said, skirmishers. Excellent skirmishers. They might not be as good as the Wood Elves when it comes to just sheer skirmishing power unit, but they will certainly cause a fair bit of concern for your opponent's army, and um, that's these Wood Elves, being, like I said, nice, fast, effective, rapid firing, very accurate skirmishing units. But they're not fantastic in a fight, so that is of course a wee bit of a problem, and they're not going to be running off any uh, light cavalry anytime soon. However, they do complement an army of Dark Elves quite well by opening the game as a skirmishing unit, fighting enemy skirmishers and inflicting a wee bit of damage to the enemy's front rank, then melting back behind the main units of Dark Elf spearmen, and then popping around on the flank to harass the enemy either with repeated crossbows straight to the side, or by uh, charging in to help out with a bit of extra numbers. A very nice, flexible little units that really should be a part of really any Dark Elf army, in my opinion, and uh, should be available in units of... Uh, I'm tempted to say 120 here, because they're a little bit weaker than the normal units, but I think I'm going to stick with 100 just because elves should be a smaller units than the other factions, at least in my opinion. Moving on, we've got the Harpies. The Harpies are much like the Harpies I described in the Beastmen, except these are a wee bit tougher, making them a little bit better at dealing with war machines, and uh, now that we have had essential confirmation that they will be air-to-air -air combat, 
the Harpies would be a really interesting unit to deploy in large numbers to deal with enemy flyers, just as chaff, of course, and of course just to fly over the battlefield and attack war machine units. Could be a pretty damn interesting unit, although of course lightly armoured, with not that great of an attack or armour save or anything along those lines. You certainly shouldn't be throwing them into proper melee units, as they are quite likely to get the shit stomped out of them. Someone who is far less likely to get the shit stomped out of them is the Executioners of Harganeth. These are very, very, very nice units indeed, and they are, uh, in my opinion, an auto include in a Dark Elf army, because you really need them to take care of large enemy monsters and other nasties. The Executioners, of course, carrying around a two-handed weapon, having good strength for elves particularly, and the Killing Blow special rule, makes them ideal for dealing with large enemy monsters like trolls, ogres, uh, giants, that kind of stuff, and they're also pretty damn good at cracking heavy armoured cavalry, seeing as the Killing Blow special rule doesn't give too much of a crap about armour, and their high strength will give them a little bit of an extra armour piercing ability. However, toughness 5, plus 5 save from uh, their armour, so uh, they can be shot to pieces quite easily, and you definitely should not be entering them into a grinding match. You should only throw in the Executioners in a battle you know you can win, or, in the case of large enemy monsters, when you don't really have that much more of an option. They also have the Dark Elf special rule, allowing them to re-roll once to wound, which is certainly handy, to say the absolute least. Considering that they wound anything, toughness 4, or below 1 or 2 plus, so yeah. If you're fighting someone, toughness 4, you have pretty much a 100% chance to wound, which is nice, certainly. As for their limitations in a total war game, mm, technically, they are quite rare, but... Um, not ridiculously so, no more so than Empire Great Swords, I suppose, so uh, yeah, you could probably just have as many of them as you want, honestly, in units of 100 or so. Um, yeah, I don't think you necessarily need to put any limitations on them beyond the fact that they are quite expensive, as they are specialist troops, so they should be uh, rather brutal on the wallet. Something else that should be pretty damn brutal on the wallet are the Cold One Knights. They're called Cold One Knights because these knights do not ride horses, they ride Cold Ones, which are, well, dinosaurs. They're called Cold Ones because they're cold-blooded. So, yeah, that's really innovative, I know, but oh well. <laughs> Anyways. The Cold One Knights are really, really, really good heavy cavalry, although they lack speed to just a little bit, and they're very cheap, well, for heavy cavalry anyways. With Always Strike First and Murderous Prowess, and the uh, mount itself being Dinosaur, has one more attack than the normal cavalry mount being, you know, horses. They are somewhat odd, though, when it comes to heavy cavalry, because they're less of a head-up charge unit and more of a flanking unit. Their speed hampers them somewhat in this regard, and you do not want them to be fighting Bretonians or Empire Heavy Knights or, God forbid, Dragon Princes of Kalidor in a straight-up charge, so they need to be handled with a little bit more care than your standard heavy cavalry unit. But of course, being relatively tough, they do still make excellent flankers and is a valuable addition to any Dark Elf army, and uh, being relatively common should be available in pretty much any numbers you want, with... I'm kind of wanting to say standard light cavalry sizes here, rather than heavy cavalry, giving you about 80 of them in a unit, seeing as they're not quite up to super heavy cavalry snuff. Then we have the Cold One Chariot. So, much like the Cold One Knights, it is a chariot pulled by Cold Ones. 
giving it a fair bit more of a straight-up fighting potential than normal chariots. This is not a Tomb King's chariot that breaks through the enemy lines, then wheels around and comes in for another go. It is not a skirmishing chariot, it is a charging, bashing, brawling, melee chariot. Crewed by Dark Elves, with pretty damn fantastic weapon skills, everything considered, and uh, you should probably have them in... what? I'm almost tempted to say units of uh, 40 odd here, like Tomb Kings, but we should probably limit them a little bit more. Um, units of 20, perhaps? But that might be too little, considering they're a grindy melee unit more so than an actual chargey, breaky unit. I'm not entirely sure. I think I'm probably gonna say 30 as a middle ground. Because they do have a fair bit of an impact, certainly, but it's not the impact of a Tomb King heavy chariot. It's not the impact of, you know, a proper heavy chariot, simply because the cold ones aren't that fast. And being somewhat stupid and vicious beasts, they're more than likely going to stop and try to numb whatever is in front of them, instead of just charging straight through them. In a Dark Elf army, it is quite a valuable unit, to be honest, because it is one of your few straight-up charge-the-front type units. Most of the uh, valuable super-heavy attack units of the Dark Elves would prefer to be charging flanks or rear rather than front, simply because of their lack of toughness and relatively low armor save. Then we have uh, the true elites of the Dark Elf army, the Black Guard. They are meant to be a little bit of a uh, phoenix guard for Malekith, although, quite honestly, the poor black guards just cannot compete with the brokenness that is the phoenix guard. Nevertheless, they are pretty damn good. They're relatively easy to damage, problematically so, because they don't have a shield and they do not have that much in the way of armor, but they hit very, very hard with their always re-rollable attacks, as they have hatred all the time against every single opponent, so you always get to re-roll if you miss, strength 4, and 2 attacks per person. So, they are quite powerful, although personally I prefer executioners or just more core units to black guards because they just simply do not have the sheer brutalizing wallop of phoenix guards, but that might just be me. However, their big upside is the simple fact that they are leadership 10 and stubborn, meaning that they're not going to be breaking any time soon. They do also have some interesting special rules, potentially. Usually, in tabletop, they are taken with a magical item called a flaming banner, meaning that they get flaming attacks, which suddenly makes them a hell of a lot more effective against large enemy monsters, as they've got the strength to wound them, and they've got the flaming attacks to stop them regenerating. I hope that magic items will uh, be implemented somehow in uh, Warhammer Total War. We know they are going to be implemented for heroes, but whether units could take, like, magic banners, we don't know yet, but yeah, I like to think that they will be able to, because that is one of the ways to actually make the Black Guards a really cool-looking unit be actually properly useful, rather than just kind of bare for fluff reasons, you know? Then we have a staple of the Dark Elf army, the Repeater Bolt Thrower, which... well, what can I say? It's a bolt thrower that shoots fast. Duh. Doi? <laughs> but yeah, the main difference between this and a normal bolt thrower is that it fires fast. Like I said, it fires volleys. Now, I'd like to see this implemented in Total War in a bit of a different way. Whereas the bolt thrower of the High Elves, for example, simply just pumps out a relatively high rate of fire consistently, I'd like to see the bolt thrower be able to fire like four or maybe six bolts in very rapid succession, and then have to reload for a uh, relatively considerable amount of time, making it very very good for dealing with large units of chaff infantry, and uh, relatively useful against monsters, I mean, if you especially got one large enemy monster like a giant, you might want the burst damage over the steady picking of the bolt thrower. 
could be a very interesting tactical tool if done with volley fire, and it'd also be a nice thing to just set it apart from, you know, the standard elf thrower. Should come in standard units of uh, four, like uh, most artillery. Then we've got the first of the beasts, the War Hydra. The War Hydra is an interesting unit, because it has three attacks, which seems absolutely crap considering how expensive it is at 160 point, but it gets one extra attack for every remaining wound, and starting out with five more wounds, meaning that an undamaged War Hydra will pump out eight attacks. This is essentially to represent that each of the heads attack, you know, because Hydra. It has a breath weapon, or at least it can be upgraded to have a breath weapon, with strength 4 and a ranged attack, so that's pretty damn good. It does not have regen. It used to, but it doesn't have it anymore, which is a little odd considering it's a Hydra, but again, blame the 5th Chaos God for that. And of course, being a rather large monstrous unit with multiple heads and a massive bulk, means that it also attacks in an AoE, or at least I hope it does so in a Total War game. In a Total War game, it should be just that. It attacks with AoE attacks, each of the heads just kind of, you know, lunging through the enemy units, snapping them up and killing them, and doing lots of AoE damage in the meantime. Really, really, really good against horde armies of chaff, but seeing as its attacks are based on how many heads it has left, it probably should be staying away from elite units with two-handed weapons and stuff like that, or even worse, things that inflict multiple wounds. A single good cannonball will knock off a considerable amount of the War Hydra's potential to actually be a unit. I mean, if you knock off uh, oh, four of its wounds, so it's only got a one left, the thing only has four attacks, which is... Oh, very, very bad for a 160 point model, so. I would like to see that represented in Total War. The less HP it has is represented by seeing heads get chopped off, and thereby the less attack power it has. Could be really cool. I think I'd like to see them in units of uh, four, really, because, you know, with the rather massive weakness of getting less damage the more damage they take, it could make them a very easy unit to neutralize if the unit is very small, like one or two models. The last of the rare units is the Scourge Runner Chariot, which is a very, very ludicrous looking chariot. It's got a single wheel in the middle, it's got to be the most unstable chariot ever designed by anyone ever and it probably wouldn't work very well, but oh well. It is very, very fast, which is good because it's also very, very light, and it is essentially a skirmishing chariot. And it comes with a bolt thrower, a so-called Ravager Harpoon, that can be fired on the move, but no multi-shot, so it's a single-shot bolt thrower, essentially. It does have a little bit of an interesting special rule, though, because being a harpoon, it is actually attached to the chariot, so that if it hits a monster and wounds it, the monster gets dragged d6 inches towards the chariot. If it goes over 3 inches, it takes a second wound with no saves. Now, how the hell that flimsy-ass chariot is going to be pulling, you know an ogre, or a troll, or a giant, I don't bloody know, but oh well, we'll just have to accept that. In Total War, I would kinda like to see that rule uh, kept, but make it a little bit different. Make it a unit, for example, of four chariot, where the four chariots all have uh, repeater crossbows that fire really quickly, so you know, you get a decent skirmishing ability out of it. And then one of the chariot, maybe a five chariot, so we got one in the middle, has the actual bolt thrower. And the bolt thrower is attached to the other chariots via ropes or chains or something along those lines. So that when you fire it, 
you hit the enemy unit and you can pull it towards you. However, to do this, the unit must be stationary, because again, you're trying to pull something like an ogre or troll, a giant, towards you. You're not going to be doing that in those flimsy ass chariot while moving at speed, absolutely not. So um, it could be a very cool unit for pulling enemy monsters out of position, so I'd kind of like it to see it implemented like that, but um, we'll have to wait and see. Otherwise, of course, there's always the option of simply making it a very fast skirmishing ball thrower with, um, you know, firing like a ball thrower, firing a little bit slower, of course, but allowing it to fire on the move in a unit of four. Could be interesting. Then, moving on to the rare units, we start out with the Doomfire Warlocks. The Doomfire Warlocks are male practitioners of dark magic that Malekith has taken a bit of an umbrage to and has punished by, well, marking their souls and, you know, doing horrible, horrible, nasty things to them. Now, a rather horrible side effect of marking their souls is that Lanesh, the god of, you know, violent rape and things like that, really, really, really wants to eat them. Which means that any Slaneshi demons nearby are going to be attracted to them like, well, moths to light, really. In tabletop, they are fast cavalry with two poisoned attacks each and, very crucially, a 4 plus ward save, so a 50 50 ward save, unless they're against any Slaneshi unit, demons or marked warriors, in which case they don't give a shit about their ward save and just eat them because Slanesh. The Doomfire Warlocks knows the uh, Doom Bolt and Soul Blight spells at level 2 and gains 1 plus to cast for each rank of 5, up to a max of plus 3. So a unit of 15 is virtually guaranteed to be casting their bound spells pretty much every turn. In Total War Warhammer, I'd kind of like to see these guys not so much as a fast cavalry unit, but maybe as uh, slaves bound to a sorceress, like a sorceress's retinue, for example, of Doomfire Warlocks, and she uses their cursed souls essentially as fuel for her own spells. But if you absolutely need them as a unit, well, how the hell would you do that? Well, give them two special abilities, I guess, which essentially is the uh, bound missiles of Doombolt and Soul Blight that does a shooting attack against enemy units, and then just give them a really good ward save of 50%. Which, even that is not going to make them a very grindy unit, but two attack, poisoned attacks with ward saves would probably make them pretty good at chasing down enemy ranged units as, you know, a volley of missiles, you know, most of them are going to miss, the ones that don't miss are going to be prevented by the ward saves, with only a handful of warlocks actually getting, well, dehorsed. And as for their abilities and the whole rank thingy, um... Maybe when the unit gets smaller, the ability could get less powerful, or maybe it would have a longer cooldown period, so if they went from standard light cavalry size of 80 down to, for example, 60, it increases the cooldown time by like 20 seconds, and decreases the damage by like 20%, and so on. Could work, I suppose. I would prefer them as a bit of a uh, retinue for a sorceress, though, just because well, that seems correct, and that's often how they are actually used in tabletop, so uh, we shall see. Then we have the uh, Sisters of Slaughter. Uh, I... I don't like this unit. I don't like this unit at all, because this is one of Matt Ward's idiot moments where he basically just looked at uh, Warhammer 40k and went like, oh, you know that unit of Dark Elf Witches that the uh, Dark Eldar have? Let's, let's just move that unit fully into Warhammer, for no bloody reason, just because. Ugh, I, I don't approve of them, I really don't. Like, if they have to be in the game, just make them a... Thing. Yeah, that's all. Just make him a thing. <sighs> uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I do not approve of this unit. I do not approve of why it was created. I do not approve of it existing. It's just... Uh, 
I don't like them. And they're worse than the witch shelves, in my opinion. They're more expensive. They got one armor save at 6 plus and a f ward save against close combat attacks, but, you know, just take witch shelves, honestly. Um, yeah. Plus, I'm not entirely convinced that the Wallscape engine would even be able to do these units because their weapon is a whip. Um, I don't think Wallscape has any kind of whip-like weapons, or even really flails, but that are actually, you know, animated properly, so... I would not cry a single tear if this particular abomination never makes its way into Total War Warhammer, so... F em. <laughs> I usually don't just flat-out ignore units, but I'm going to be ignoring this one. And then we have the Karhidbus. The Karhidbus is a deep sea monster, technically, in the fluff. Uh, why a deep sea monster would be amphibious, I don't bloody know. Um, why can it survive and just open air? Why does it have legs? It's, does it really need legs while well, being a deep sea? Uh, oh well, <clears throat> screw all of that, I suppose. It is a pretty damn good monster, though. It's got high strength of 7, which means it's fantastic for dealing with enemy monsters. And if you concentrate all of its attacks against a single enemy model, again, making it a fantastic monster killer, it gets an additional d6 strength 7 hits. And, of course, it's got poison attacks, so yeah, it's fantastic against large enemy monsters. You probably don't want to send it in against units of Ogre, simply because there's too many of them and they're going to bring it down relatively quickly by weight of numbers and, you know, weight of Ogre fucking flesh banging into it. But uh, against single enemy monsters, like perhaps a dragon or um, a giant or even trolls and relatively small units, it could work really, really, really well. And it's also pretty tough. It still doesn't have regeneration like the Hydra used to, but it has scaly skin, armor save of 4 plus, and toughness 5 with 5 wounds. And unlike the Hydra, if you lose wounds on this one, it doesn't make it shit. So it's a very, very, very good unit, and it's also a very cool unit. One of the few new units that I actually approve of. Um, I have to mention, though, oddly enough, it is a deep-sea monster, yes, but it doesn't have the aquatic rule. Uh, so, it can't enter water, which makes no sense whatsoever, but oh well. I'd kind of like to see that in Total War Warhammer, though, if you're fighting over a uh, river, as you have units that can actually cross the river with aquatic special rules, or units that are just big enough to just wade through the river, like a giant, for example. Could be a really cool little twist on the uh, potential tactics for, you know, bridge battles and that kind of usually relatively boring stuff. Then, next, we have another creation of the Fifth Chaos God, the Destroyer of Fluff and Layer of Waste of Favorite Armies, Matt Ward, the Bloodwrack Medusa. I think I dislike this one even more than the Sisters of Slaughter. Like, the model is fantastic, you kidding me? It's beautiful, but here's the thing. First of all, this is kind of a deep-sea monster that hates everything, including the Dark Elves, that has apparently been enslaved by some odd reason, and if you meet the Bloodwrack's eyes, it makes you bleed to death from every pore or orifice in your body. Which you'd think would make it somewhat problematic to have in an army, wouldn't you? Like, half of your soldiers are probably gonna die before you even get to the battlefield, and good fucking luck going up to the Medusa with a paper bag and going like, hey love, could you wear this for a moment? <laughs> Cause, yeah. And additionally, if it's basically primary and practically only attack is making you bleed to death through every pore in your body, how does this work against undead exactly? How does it work against vampires? How does it work against skeletons? How does it work against zombies? You know, stuff that don't have blood, don't need blood, don't have eyes, or don't have physical bodies. like. Fucking right, weights, or ghosts, etc. Like, what? Uh, uh, plus, it's kinda terrible. It it has a leadership of two. 
Okay, so, you know, shoot the thing and it's gonna go run screaming off the battlefield. I don't like it, it's... It's a bad unit. What can I say? And it makes no sense from a fluff perspective either, it's just... Also, I, I'd like to point out that um, this is a deep sea monster, or well, deep sea, sea monster, in the Warhammer world, that if you meet its eyes, it makes you bleed to death. Now, for the vast majority of you, you might not know, because this is a bit of an obscure fluff thingy, but the Warhammer world is of course filled with sea monsters. Amongst others, massive sharks, like literal megalodons, yeah? And other monsters that smell blood from miles upon miles away. And you are telling me that the Medusa is still a bloody lie. Essentially, every time the Medusa gets herself a meal, every single monstrous creature for miles around are gonna go like, Ooh, you smell that? Someone just dumped like 20 gallons of blood into the sea. I'ma head over there and numb it. So, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of the Medusa at all. So, skipping along. Um, and, and the Blood Rack Shrine. It's, it's, it's a bigger, stupider Medusa on a shrine. If you had trouble keeping your own army from bloody bleeding to death with just a Medusa somewhere in the army, let's make it a little bit harder, shall we? Let's put the Medusa, who if you even look at the bastard thing, you just bleed to death, let's put her on a giant plinth in the middle of the army, and then, just as an added bonus, let's put a big-ass mirror behind her so that no matter where the bloody hell you are looking from, you gon' die. Yeah, sounds like an absolutely brilliant fucking idea. <sighs> this might be the stupidest dune in any f fantasy game ever. Really, it's it's remarkable. Truly, it is. It's yeah. I'm not even gonna touch upon it. Ugh, spare me, spare me the ravages of the fifth chaos god. I would not cry many salty tears if I heard that the Dark Elf army in Total War Warhammer is going to be, well, practically the 6th edition army, shall we just say. So, yeah, that has been it for the uh, Dark Elf army. I'm sorry on some of the units, to be honest. There's... I really, really don't like this current uh, version of the army, to be completely honest with you. It's too many silly units in it. The fifth Chaos God Matt Ward did many horrible things, like Warhammer was less affected at it, like what he did to Warhammer 40,000 is just disgraceful. Ugh. He destroyed some of the best goddamn armies in 40k. I could rant for quite a while on the many, many sins of the Slayer of Fluff, but I shall try to restrain myself, so, uh, despite my somewhat negative attitude to the army, I hope it has been somewhat informative. I have been Arch, thank you very much for listening, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Have a good day.